This lesson deals with the principle of superposition. You can find these notes in the course ebook in chapter 3 starting on page 19. In our last videos, we did some examples of writing circuit equations where we had independent sources, and they showed up on the left-hand side of our matrix equation. And we'd seen that before, and had given some reasons for that on page 9. I'm going to use that idea to prove a very powerful theorem in circuits that's called superposition. Let me first state the principle of superposition, then I'll give you an example. The response from a number of independent sources acting simultaneously is simply the sum of the responses which would be produced by each of the independent sources acting alone with all of the other independent sources set equal to zero. Suppose I had a circuit where I was solving for V out and I had three sources, maybe two voltage sources and a current source. What this theorem is saying is that I can find V out by adding up three results. The first one is to set all but one source is equal to zero. Find V out. Then take the next voltage source, setting all the other sources equal to zero, and find V out again. And then lastly, find V out to the current source. And then if you add up those three results, that's the same result you would get by analyzing the circuit by leaving all three sources in, like we had done previously. Now why is this true? Suppose we write a set of mesh equations, since we just talked about that. Suppose I have four meshes. So I'll have a mesh current I1, I2, I3, and I4. And suppose they're all unknown. And I write a set of equations, and suppose that in mesh 1 there are just voltage sources. So the voltage sources will show up on the left-hand side of the equation with some relationship between the mesh currents, as we've seen previously. And the voltage sources may show up with a scalar of 1 or, or some number multiplying them. And suppose the same is true for mesh number 2. Then in meshes 3 and 4, suppose they have current sources in it. And again, we read some kind of relationship between the current sources and the mesh currents. Now the units and the elements in here would be in ohms if we have voltage in terms of current, and if we have current in terms of current, the units here would be dimensionless. Now suppose that we solve for the current I1 using Kramer's rule. Well, we take our equations on the previous page, which is our matrix relating the mesh currents to our sources, and that's our R matrix. I'll call the determinant of that delta R. And then in the numerator for solving for I1, we take that same matrix, but take the column associated with I1, which is the first column, and replace it by the left-hand side of the equation. Suppose that we solve this determinant by expanding down column one. What that means is the following. I would take this entry here and multiply it by the determinant of this matrix. It'd be the first term. We just erase that. Then we would take the next term and actually multiply it by minus one times the determinant with wiping out this row and this column. So I'd have this matrix here with this row, this row, and this row. Then I would add that to the next, which is this term, wiping out this row and this column with this three by three matrix. And then lastly, I take this term times a minus one times the determinant by wiping out this row and this column of this resulting matrix. And then I'll be divided by delta R. This is shown on the next page. Suppose we multiply all this out. So I had a voltage source, say, in here called V sub S1. It's going to get multiplied by this ratio of determinants and also a scalar. And then added to that would be, say, V sub S2, again, multiplied by some ratio of determinants times a scalar. Now, V sub S1 or V sub S2 may also show up in here. But again, I'd just be multiplying that voltage times some ratio of matrices and scalars. This may be true of our current sources in our circuit. So I'd have I1 as something times V sub S1 through x voltage sources. And the same is true if I had y current sources. I'd have some scalar, it was a ratio of determinants, times the current sources that I have, say if I had y of those. Suppose that I set all of these sources equal to zero but one, then I can solve for k1. If I were to set all the sources equal to zero but this one, I could get k2, and so on down the line through k sub r. The total response, in this case we're doing i1, can be found by calculating the response due to one source at a time, with all the other sources set equal to zero and adding up the results. And that's the principle of superposition. In the principle of superposition, we talked about setting sources equal to zero. For a voltage source, we have a specified voltage and an unspecified current. If you set the voltage equal to zero, you still have an unspecified current. But this is our definition of a short circuit. Setting a voltage source equal to zero is replacing it by a short circuit. Likewise, for a current source, we have a given value of current, and an arbitrary voltage across it are unspecified. 
set that now equal to zero, you still have this condition where the voltage across the current source is still arbitrary or unspecified. But that's our definition of an open circuit. Setting a current source equal to zero is replacing it by an open circuit. Let's go back and do an example we did previously. We solve for the node voltages V1 and V2, but let's do that this time by superposition. The voltage V1 is going to be made up of two results. I'm going to call that V1 prime and V1 double prime, and do the same thing for V2. Where V1 prime and V2 prime are the values of V1 and V2 just due to the 3 milliamp source, setting the 5 milliamp equal to zero. And then V1 double prime and V2 double prime will be the values of V1 and V2 by setting the 3 milliamp source equal to zero and finding the results due to the 5 milliamp source. We're just going to add the results together. My prime result will be due to the 3 milliamp source with a 5 milliamp set equal to zero, which is an open circuit. I'm going to call this V1 prime and V2 prime. It's not my final answer. It's one piece of a summation. Now, whatever V1 prime is, I can find V2 prime by using voltage divider because the current in these two resistors is the same. Whatever V1 prime is, V2 prime is going to be 1K over 3K plus 1K, and that's a quarter. Let's solve for V1 prime. Because these two resistors are in series, I can replace them by one 4K resistor. Now when I do that, the voltage V2 prime disappears, but this is an equivalent circuit. I'm gonna use that to find V1 prime. Two resistors in parallel. This current is gonna flow into these two elements. Three milliamps times 1K in parallel with 4K will be the product over the sum, and that's gonna be 4K squared over 5K. And when the K squares cancel, the K and the milli cancel, and I get 12 divided by five, which is 2.4. Now, now that I know this, I can go back and get V2 prime as V1 prime, 2.4 times a quarter, and that's 0.6 volts. Due to the first source acting alone with a 5 milliamp source set equal to zero. Find the double prime result. Set the 3 milliamp source equal to zero, it's an open circuit. And now I'm going to solve for V1 and V2 due to the second source. I'm going to call those double prime. Whatever V2 double prime is, again, I could solve for V1 double prime because this current is the same. I could use voltage divider. V1 double prime is equal to V2 double prime times 1K over 1K plus 3K. And again, it's equal to a quarter. Replace this by its equivalent circuit of 4K. Again, we're going to lose this, but we already know the relationship. The voltage is in this direction, so I need the current to go in this direction. So I'm going to turn that current source around and call it a minus 5 milliamps. That current times the parallel combination of these resistors would be the voltage V2 double prime. 1K in parallel with 4K, so product over sum gives me 4K over 5. The k's in the milli cancel, the fives cancel, I get minus four volts. If V2 double prime is minus four volts, then V1 double prime is a quarter of that, or minus one volt. And now we can add the two results up. This is our first value of V1, our first value of V2, our second value of V1, our second value of V2. And we get 1.4 and minus 3.4. These were the same results we found. We did the same problem back on page six and on page 17. Now this might seem like it's more work, but you realize when you open and short things, the circuit gets a lot simpler. And sometimes that makes the circuit very easy to analyze using our shortcut techniques like current divider, voltage divider, and so on. And this is the principle of superposition, an example using it.